Hello and welcome to today's virtual lunch and learn, which is entitled Advisor Panel, Technology and Growing AUM. Today's event is brought to you by IT Synergy, serving clients throughout the Phoenix and Denver metro areas. IT Synergy delivers compliance, cybersecurity, and managed IT services to investment advisory firms. My name is Ted Holsey and I'm your host for today's event. First, let's go through a few housekeeping items. All participants are in listen-only mode. Today's session will be recorded and circulated to all registrants. Thank you for joining in for the live session. Your questions are strongly encouraged throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring the Q&A log in real time, and we'll be sure to ask our speakers your questions as we go along. Please make sure to use the Q&A tool and use the chat function for comments only. We look forward to your input and feedback throughout the conversation. Today's session is a virtual lunch and learn. We have provided each participant with a $25 DoorDash gift certificate. You should have received your unique code via a personalized calendar invite. Our goal is to allow you to enjoy a convenient lunch while listening in on today's discussion. If there are any issues with your gift certificate, please contact me directly and I'll try to resolve it in real time. If you forgot about the lunch part, rest assured your gift certificate is active and hopefully you can use it at a later time. Now, now let me introduce the sponsor for today's event. Michael Kokenauer is the founder and CEO of IT Synergy. He now has over 25 years in the IT field. Under his leadership, IT Synergy has built an impressive client roster and has experienced exponential revenue growth. Michael has been recognized as a Microsoft MVP, as well as having earned certification as a certified ethical hacker, as well as an investment advisor certified compliance professional. Michael and his firm help RIAs manage their cybersecurity risks and stay compliant with SEC regulations. Michael will share some of the key insights into how RIA leaders can get started taking their cybersecurity and compliance approach to another level. Now let me introduce our panelists. First up is Mark Ackerman. Mark is a private wealth financial advisor at Wells Fargo Advisors. Mark has dedicated over 20 years to delivering independent financial advice to clients. Mark focuses on advising company founders, entrepreneurs, executives, corporations, foundations, and multi-generational high net worth families. He is part of the Wells Fargo Advisors Retirement Plan Advisor Program, which is reserved specifically for advisors who have demonstrated extensive experience in helping businesses design, build, administer, and review corporate retirement plans. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Benjamin Lau. Ben is Chief Investment Officer and Principal of Aprium Advisors based in Orange County, California. Ben has been with Aprium for almost 20 years and has been CIO since 2016. As CIO, he leads the firm's investment management committee that oversees areas including trading, research, client commun and cl client communications. Ben, thanks for joining. And finally, Matt Reiner. Matt is the co-founder of CEO of Benjamin, a technology company focused on delivering SaaS-based solutions to other financial services companies, enabling them to streamline internal communication and business processes while delivering a digital client experience that goes beyond traditional client portals. Matt is also a partner at Capital Investment Advisors, a fee-only wealth management firm focused on delivering income-oriented investment solutions to individuals and families. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Okay, well, let's let's get into the conversation. Um, thanks a lot for everybody for joining us. Um, Matt, we, we kind of wanted to start out today's dialogue with kind of talking about uh, the pandemic and COVID and kind of, you know, what the, the last year has brought us. Um, I mean, how has the pandemic and COVID really impacted uh, financial advisory firms? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's fair to say that it's accelerated a lot of trends that we saw in the industry that we may have been able to push off in the past that we were not really able to push off. And there's, you know, the digital client experience, of course, um, but it's also really focused firms into um, how they need to evolve and deliver more services and more values, along with how do they need to better serve their employees. There's a lot of interesting things that happened during the pandemic within our industry uh, that kind of highlighted some of our, you know, pain points uh, that people were hiding away. And the first part is competition and the commoditization of uh, of kind of investment management, right? I think that what we saw in this pandemic was what some of the true root value of a financial advisor is that we all knew, but I think our clients continue to see it even in a heightened way with regards to the personal relationship, right? Being able to handhold uh, individuals through an uncertain time. It was uncertain for us as firms in the wealth management space. 
but it was also very uncertain for clients. And I think that there was a, a bifurcation between uh, or separation between firms that did a, a really great job um, in terms of communicating, staying on top and uh, uh, really embracing digital to be able to communicate and stay on top of different things with it, with their clients. And then there was some that lagged and it took them a while to get up to speed with DocuSign. And um, I think what this particular aspect showed is um, that as an industry, we are gonna be pressed on having to deliver more value, more services, and even higher level of servicing to our clients. And I always remember back to a, a recent benchmarking study by Schwab that basically showed that financial advisors uh, are adding more services. So they looked at uh, firms that have 250 million of AUM uh, or more, um, and those that added services between 2015 and 2019. And basically every firm in there, the, the, in terms of the services offered, every firm that was that high increased the number of services that they were providing to their clients. Anything from tax planning and tax strategy to lifestyle management. And I think that what this has shown and what we can learn from the pandemic with this digital transformation is that this is really a challenge for the space with regards to margin compression. Uh, and everybody talks about fee compression, but it's really margin compression. We're gonna be delivering more services um, and we're gonna charge the same fee because in that same study, all firms increased the number of services they're providing and they all included them in their assets under management fee. 81% of them had included in their assets under management fee. And so as an industry, I think what we have to figure out and what we learned in this pandemic is that we have to be really thoughtful in, in how we adopt technology, how we adopt the digital transformation in a way to allow us and enable us to be scaled as a firm to grow um, the ability for us to serve more people with the same number of human capital. And I think that a lot of financial advisors saw that they are able to do that. And we were very hesitant of it before the pandemic, but the pandemic forced it upon us to, uh, to really evolve the way that we, uh, that we serve and we think about building and growing our business uh, going forward. And you know, I think that that really starts from the acceptance of integrations, the acceptance of using you know, things like DocuSign, better leveraging our technologies that we already have. It doesn't mean you have to go out and buy new technologies. It's just a matter of how do we better utilize uh, the technologies that we currently have today. So, so Matt, Ben, you're muted. So just feel free to, and Matt, Mark Matt and, so and Ben, feel free to jump in. Matt, Matt is so right, you know, especially from, from where I sit as, as managing the investments for the firm, there really has been a bifurcation of, of just how we just invest client assets, right? And, 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 and we do have an active strategy that, that's done quite well, but we do have a passive strategy where we, where we put a lot of clients in. And, and I, I know the big trend in the past few years has been these robo-advisors, right? And they, they provide so much efficiency for our businesses uh, and just for my team. But what do I put that now? I, I freed up five hours of say manpower, right? Now where do I put those five hours? And that really is that client communication. That really is a handholding part that Matt was talking about. That you have to pair that high tech kind of uh, a solution with some personal advice. Like th that that mobile advisor is really not going to talk to you <laughs> in, 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 on March 23rd of last year, right? They're not going to give you advice or, or, or hold your hand in, in, in late March of last year. And I think that that's what the pandemic highlighted, right? Is that the robo advisors are tools, but the the management of, and I think that that's the challenge that we're facing as an investment advisor industry as well. Is right, we were so we 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 hung our value so much on um, investment management for so long, and then robos came in and said, well, maybe there's another option. And I don't think that they, I think that there's skills that we have as investment managers that robos necessarily don't have, but there is something to be said about that that tool that you can have in your toolbox. But what it really highlighted, and we saw it in the pandemic, is that our value is managing emotions, right? Fear and human emotions are what keeps people from reaching their financial goals. And our value is, is enabling and, and providing the plan and helping to stick true to that plan uh, in that period of time. Because if we can keep someone from going to cash, because we always know it's hard to go to cash, and we can keep them to weather the storm and stay on the up, that's a value. And our value needs to be exemplified and the way that we can do that is by letting technology do some of this things that aren't necessarily needed to be done by a human to give us more time to go and spend it with clients whether it's on a zoom or a webex or whatever it may be or just to be talking to them more frequently and i think that that was really highlighted because we all saw that the firms that did that really well their client satisfaction scores went through the roof and, and you can see that the ones that didn't, the client satisfaction scores, they started to question things a little bit more, even if they had some good performance. So, so talk talk a little bit about the the laggards versus the leaders. I mean, in that time of crisis, 
in the first couple months of the pandemic. You know, what were some of the practical uh, experiences that that advisors that were leveraging technology were able to execute on, and those that were the laggards missed out on, or were challenged? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, you can start simply with just people that were on you were you were utilizing cloud technologies. So it was easier for them to have everybody pick up their computers and go home, right? And those that were still kind of tied to their workstations and their computer, it was a little bit more difficult, and everybody was running around in circles, which delayed the ability for advisors to stay in, in touch with clients, right? So let's just start in the simple way of, of the benefit of the cloud, which has been a trend for the past 10 years, at least, uh, that some firms adopted and some didn't. And then you think about paperwork and DocuSign. If you had DocuSign implemented, the ability to continue to generate new business because it was a new business opportunity because people were fearful and making switches. Um, and DocuSign was there as well. Um, and, and I would say that just the ability to communicate with clients in a scalable way, right? Some firms didn't have, a lot of firms didn't know what Zoom was or they didn't use WebExes. And the ones that did were able to launch up, you know, for instance, one of our firms here in Atlanta, you know, we had weekly Zoominars with our clients during the, and we were able to do it from March 13th going forward and continuously doing it. And we were able to communicate. And because we had the data, the right data within our CRM, we were able to understand who were the people that were going to be concerned who were, and we were able to communicate with them more frequently because we had all the processes in place. And, you know, there's, there was 77% of firms said they lost clients because they couldn't communicate via technology. I just think that that is staggering, right? And when you think about building a, a firm and, and the need to be innovative and, and adopt new technologies, not necessarily new technologies, just better use the technologies you have and make sure you're getting the most out of them and the most adoption out of them, that's going to be good for client retention and talent acquisition and talent retention, which is the, the, I mean, that's a huge expense, right? If someone leaves the expense of having to find good quality talent in our industry right now. And we saw that in the pandemic, people were leaving because they saw they were losing books, their book of business because they didn't have the tools and their leadership wasn't investing in the tools that were needed to keep uh, them to be able to communicate and engage with their clients. So, so let's talk about that talent part. And, and what are what are the friction points? I mean, what are the what are the things that make people less productive or get in the way of of achieving their mission in the job? And and what are what should leaders be really thinking about in terms of using technology as a way to empower your people to make them more productive? Yeah, I think that the biggest, and I think Mark and Ben would would agree. I think one of the biggest challenges with technology is that we it's easy to access, it's hard to get adoption, right? And um, and you can bring all the greatest and best technologies around, but getting adoption because it's not another username and password. It's another URL. It's another place I have to remember, okay, in this situation, I go here. In that situation, I go there. And so it's not a matter of just getting new technology. I think that the real, uh, what we saw as the real accelerator for those firms that did really well in the pandemic was the ability to integrate the technologies together. And when I say integrate, it's not just like what you hear the buzzwords in the industry of like single sign on or that you can have a few pieces. It's really like, how do you get information that's deeply integrated to where your CRM has the kind of the central hub, but you're able to utilize data from your custodian, data from your calendar, data from your portfolio management system to start actually executing on tasks. And you can take the simplest one as DocuSign, right? How do we get, we have that information. Why do I have to have someone on my team go and put that information into DocuSign if I already have it inside one source? And if I'm not, and if I, I should be doing a better job of gathering that information once and having that technology integrate to my CRM to fill in those fields so I don't have to data duplicate and replicate that process. Uh, and then that should then be able to spur off uh, DocuSign workflows. That type of mentality of integrating, that's three different technologies that would have to be integrated. I think that it's a, um, uh, I think it's a, it's a, a better use of time to think about how to create better processes in your firm. Where's the wasted process and how can I better use my technologies together to get the most out of them as opposed to just adding more technologies. And so the firms that really excelled had already started that and they were able to spin it up again. They're on the cloud and they were able to spin it up because they already had the right processes and they had a focus on having the data communicate amongst uh, each other. The thing that drives me the most nuts in our office, Matt and, and, and Ted and everyone is, is really those things that we do. It's like those one step processes that we do like a thousand times a day. Right. And, and I think about my admin staff. The simple thing of just confirming appointments, right? <laughs> it's like 10, 15 calls a day that they do every day. Um, you know, sign, get, getting papers signed, facts and confirmations. Um, a big pain, pain point for me, I feel like a doctor when I say this, but like a big pain point for us and the advisor side is really 
just getting caught up on notes, just get just getting clan, uh, clan, uh, getting caught up on CRM notes, right? Our volume of activity has increased in the last year because we we're, were at home for so long, doing a lot. I mean, I can bang out five Zoom meetings a day instead of three maybe in-person meetings and a bunch of phone calls. So my activity is so high. That increases you know, obviously at risk, but also how we enter all those notes in. And I feel like I'm so backlogged on, on, on notes and and, and 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 automating some of that part. Automating CRM is a huge thing. But and I think that to that point, right? It, you know, if you look at it, there's been study after study. 40% of your day, if you were just a time track, 40% of your day are doing those one-off tasks. Going to check the custodian to see if your if the new accounts have opened, going to check the custodian platform to see if it's been funded and ready to be traded. Checking in with Joe Smith to see if they've gotten their docu sign and can sign it, right? And then getting notes after the meetings. And and the beauty is is that in the confirms, right? You're scheduling meetings. Just the idea of scheduling a meeting. If you do a quarterly review and you have 100 clients, you're doing that 400 times a year, right? That you're reaching out to them. And I would bet that not everybody schedules right away. So you're then following up with them and then following up with them again. Uh, and the ease of that, that is such an easy solution that you can you know, connect to your CRM and have that. That's what we created, you know, in our technology as part of the learnings that we've had in the past, even before the pandemic was, you know, what we call as a business support system. And, and the whole goal of a business support system is, is been to do, and, and we didn't prep this, but to do exactly what you're saying, right? Is the idea of, you know, in your CRM, you have this recurring task to schedule meetings. And even if you are sending like a Calendly link out, someone has to go and send that email out. That is a task that takes time. Um, and Benjamin, which is a business support system, is able to send it out for them on their behalf, right? And getting notes. We know when the meeting's done, how can we not have technology that can send you, Ben, as an, as an advisor, an email, just to put the, email, the notes in or a text, just being like, what are the notes? And that is the integration that is able to be done and the automation steps that I think were really highlighted in this time because we're gonna be able to scale the more Zoom meetings we do, we're gonna have more meetings, which just creates our to-do list to be even larger that if we don't have that automation, then it's not gonna work. And the automation is really only as good as the processes that we have and the integrations that our technologies have. And I think a focus on that is really, really important. So so what does it mean for growth? I mean, and what does it mean for growth and what does it mean for um, organizations that are looking to just grow at a best in class rate? So if you invest in these technologies, if your advisors are more productive, if you're taking all that busy work out of the day and you're using automation to kind of integrate all these data flows, what does it mean in terms of opportunity for growing faster than your competition? I mean, I'll take that, but I think that Mark and Ben have probably really good insight in that. I mean, I would just say that the, the <clears throat> a greater and more value, value is, in the, is perceived by the beholder, right? And if the client perceives that they're getting more value out of it, they're gonna talk about you more, right? And if you're communicating with them more frequently, you're providing them more opportunities for them to hear your story and get updated and, and you're able to control that narrative from what you're viewing as opposed to them controlling it based on the headlines, referrals are gonna come through, right? We saw that right out the gate when we started enhancing our client experience through these automation tools. But then it's also, you, have, you do have more time to go do business building, right? If I'm able to give an advisor that's growth oriented, right? Sometimes if they're not growth oriented, it's hard to help them from that standpoint because it's not just gonna bring leads in, but they're growth minded and they have 20% more time Maybe that's two lunches a, a, a week. Maybe that's 10 more phone calls a week. Um, and, and that drives growth. Growth is in your actions that you take. And the more actions you can take, the better you're gonna grow. And if they're not doing the menial mundane stuff that takes up 40% of our day, that inherently is gonna drive growth from the growth minded, but it's also just gonna generate referrals as well. I think to add to that, part of the, the future and the growth that I see in, in this industry is, and the basis that well a lot of a lot has changed not everything has changed what hasn't changed is that personal trusted relationships are still the core of this industry in this business you know you're not going to have a you're not going to have a successful um, practice you're not going to serve clients to have su successful outcomes in investing or financial planning um, if you don't have a good personal relationship and a trusting relationship so that hasn't changed. What has changed is is probably what we call the the table stakes of the business. You know, where as Matt mentioned, the uh, investing has become commoditized to a large stretch of the of the imagination. But other things have been important, but have really become commoditized. If you don't have 
the best technology that is client-centric, client-friendly. If you don't have um, secure systems that is, you know, protecting client um, information, um, those are table stakes. If you don't have those basics now, and we, again, we've always known technology is, imp is important, but what did change through this um, pandemic is it's not it's not just important, but it's 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 a table stake. You know, if you don't have good technology, if you don't have a secure uh, environment for a client, um, then you, you, you're not going to make it in this industry. You're not going to make it in this business and clients aren't going to you know, come to you. So you're not going to grow. Yeah, I think, I think Mark's exactly right. Some of this technology stuff is, is, is great, but I don't know if we necessarily made it, made any recent technology investment based on the fact that for its, its growth, I'm trying to do two things, right? Make a better client experience and make a better advisor experience. I'm trying to make those things easier for everyone. Right. And, and, and we've had so much, you know, Mark would hope we've had so much compliance issues in the last 20 years with the SEC, and hopefully technology is going to make it. It's just been so burdensome. It's just so burdensome. Email compliance, this and that, marketing compliance, and, and hopefully technology will make it easier to be an advisor. Help make it make make, make us make it easier to do our jobs in the future. I think yeah, Mark. I mean, you're so spot on. Yeah. Oh, go on, Ben. Sorry. Go ahead, Matt. No, I, I mean, Mark's so spot on. I don't think that, and I think that that's, I, I think that um, what what I what I think also came out of this pandemic is that advisors, I think, were so fearful that technology was going to replace them. And, and, and they also stayed away from technology because they were like, well, the clients are going to think that my relationship with them, it's not worthy of, because we're using technology. So it's not like, the relationship's not as good. So it's my clients that don't want video conference. It's my clients that don't want DocuSign. Uh, because they don't, and what we realized was that that's actually not true at all. It, the clients actually love not having to drive an hour into the office to spend, uh, you know, an hour and then and 45 minutes going back. And the clients love the simplicity of doing DocuSign. It's not for everybody. It doesn't mean it's for everybody, but a majority of people that you assume that it wasn't for, they actually really do enjoy it. And I think that advisors fear technology for replacing what their value is. Um, and I, I think that the pandemic showed that advisors deliver much more value. And I'll say this, no matter how good technology is, and I'm fortunate to be in like a space where we're building technology for wealth, for wealth managers, I, we're never going to replace a wealth manager. Uh, that's just the case. You don't have the EQ ability to walk someone off. And even with developments in AI and you know, artificial intelligence and, uh, and VR and everything of that nature, you're not going to replace the ability for someone to handhold when they've lost a loved one or they've lost a job or they're trying to secure retirement. And they have to go from this mentality of moving from earning years to the income years. Human is needed. We're still human intelligence and, uh, and technology is not going to replace that. But technology can allow us to do more of what we do good that they can't replace us on, which is having those communications and helping through those situations. I, I so let's, Matt, just to just to to drive that point home. I'm sorry, Ted. Just just for a second, just to drive that point home is is I think you know one of the things that's important to remember when you talk about technology potentially replacing the advisor is that it is definitely possible to overdo on automation, right? Like there's a balance that has to be struck here. And and you know one of the problems with technology is sometimes technology can run away from you, and you can over automate. And you know you get these systems that start you know sending out reminders or whatever else, and people just get overwhelmed, and then it becomes noise, and they and they start ignoring it. And so you know I think you have to be careful. And and that's really to your point about the advisor not being replaced is we want technology to supplement and and like Ben said to make things easier for both the client and the advisor, but we have to be careful about not over automating and not letting the technology run wild. Yeah. Fair yeah, point. and I that's think, and I think it's it's really about. Um, I mean, I think Ben said it. It's about the advisor's experience leveraging technology. And Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about? You know, you guys really went went deep with just video based collaboration during the pandemic in a couple different dimensions. Can you talk about your experience uh, with your team and how you guys leverage video? Sure, sure. Yeah, with video, I'd probably put it in three different buckets: how we utilize video for the team in managing uh, the practice um, and the, the staff and all the advisors. Um, the second tranche would be how we did client strategy reviews, um, and then how we did client events, if if you call that marketing. Uh, with with the team, in a lot of ways, it, it's it's made it more efficient, where we have you know three scheduled Zoom um, or you know, pick the service that you use um, uh, meetings with the team. 
So everyone knows in the morning huddle, uh, we're getting together and we can see each other. So not everyone's in the office. Uh, I think it's effective to still see each other. There's a reason we're doing this in this um, format versus a conference call. It is more effective and impactful to see people and, and, and interact in that way. Uh, and for the, for the team that's on the office, it's a, another way of keeping them connected uh, and, and on point. For client strategy reviews, uh, we have clients all over the, the country. And you know, historically, you fly to New York to meet with the clients, you fly to Aspen to meet with the clients, wherever you're going, um, that personal interaction is, is what we have done in the past to be effective. Well, when we thought about it, the clients that were coming into the office were often getting a different experience than when we were going out to you know, at Atlanta to meet with a client. In the office, we're throwing up their financial plan on the screen behind me, and and we can be interactive and 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 uh, you know playing with different strategies for their for their wealth plan or for their financial plan while they're sitting in front of us. Um, so a couple upticks for um, with this new technology coming through, we can do that with any client now, whether they're down the street or whether they're in Miami, um, and. So with any given client, any given meeting, we can be running scenarios, we can share screens. Um, so we're having, I think, um, overall much more impactful and, and productive meetings as a whole, utilizing uh, video and versus being in person. Um, again, I think being in person when you can from time to time is still uh, ideal, um, but you know the reality is you, you know, you're not spending 24 hours a day with your clients and they'd much rather have you um, you know, be helping them with positive outcomes than you know than having breakfast with them at once a week. So the technology has really helped us, I think, be much more impactful and productive on the strategy review meetings. But then when it comes to um, even client events, we historically have done them quarterly, um, and they range from uh, investments to um, cybersecurity to the environment and sustainability. Uh, we do an annual wine tasting event. Um, but in the past, we would, for example, get maybe 40 couples to a wine tasting event. We've done it for 10 years. Great event. Uh, we have a former head of Chrissy's come in and do the wine deal. But that's focusing on the people that are just, you know, within shouting distance from uh, our office here in Los Angeles. Last year during the pandemic, we did it virtually, and we were able to get, uh, I think, about 60 to 65 couples around the country. Um, you know, similar to you, you know, you doing the the DoorDash, we sent wine across the country and and had a sommelier do it virtually, and and people loved it. It was probably we probably had some of the most you know raving results from that, um, and it was not even an in-person wine tasting, which sounds funny. Um, and then another point that Matt kind of touched on when it comes to the events, um, we started doing them in the middle of the pandemic, and we did it about every other week with this type of technology where once a year we'll do an investment conference and we'll bring in you know, uh, you know, a big name that would be recognizable to everyone here that you know, is on CNBC and Bloomberg and you know, whoever it is, um, often quoted in everything, right? Now with this format, instead of having to schedule that person a year in advance and figure out how to get them into LA and, and do it in LA, we were able to have some of the, the top um, names and prognosticators zoom in, and we did you know 10 of those last year, um, and it, it was much easier to, uh, to put together, much easier to bring in the top talent to speak to our clients. Um, and finally, we were able to reach all clients instead of having to cap it at, say, 50 people that we can fit into you know, shutters by the beach. Uh, so this technology really helped us, you know, um, meet it, meet the clients where they were, and um, and we'll continue to do so going forward. In my opinion, it's it's crazy how some of these events, you know, because we do the same thing in some of these like the investment conference or something, right? I, I'm we've been doing it for a while online and near the webinars, but I'm, but recently with the pandemic, we really started pushing and recording them, kind of like what you guys are doing today, recording them and, and putting them on YouTube or something. I'm really surprised at how long these legs are on some of these things. Like clients will come to us two, three, three, four, four months later. Hey, I saw your thing on this. I'm like, Oh, my wife watched it. You know, my wife. You know, it's it, 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 it's amazing that, that that prospects and clients will see it months later. And, and, and well, I mean, that's the that's the beauty of it, right? That you can turn these events into marketing material pieces that can live forever, right? I mean, instead of having to get a video production staff to come to the event and do a recording, you have it all right there. And then you're exactly right. Like, put it up on YouTube, put it up on the website. 
you're, you're basically, you know, hitting three birds with one stone because you can have it be, you know, continued client communication in between the quarter. It can be client material and content marketing uh, during for growth to help you continue to grow to show off, you know, what you're doing without doing, you know, the advertising rules. Um, and I think it's, it's just a, it, it, it does multiple things at once um, that we never were able to do in the past. And, and it, like some of this long form content that we've been producing, like the webinar, it's, you know, we have a marketing committee here in the office, which really means three millennials got together and started putting things together for us. Um, but they but they've just been cutting up these these web clips, right? And 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 the biggest comment that we got about some of these webinars, yeah, we had a good amount of clients signing up for them. But the biggest comment we got in these surveys is make everything shorter. Everyone wants everything shorter. Is so we can cut these webinars down to 30, 45 second, 120 second clips and throw that on Instagram or or or, or Facebook or, or or LinkedIn or whatever it is, right? And and so. You know, it's it's the one cool thing about technology is that it is you know with 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 a couple of things like Hootsuite or or Canva, these these kids have been able to punch out some amazing content. Like I didn't, I'm still using PowerPoint, you know, and you know, and, and and they're great. And I think right, that so, you know, I, I would tell everybody that if they want to get into it, right, and do it, don't be discouraged by the number of people that show up because what we found, and I was actually having a conversation with our team about it earlier, is the advisors in in our firm, you know, they would do it, and they may only have 25 people show up out of their book of business, but then they send it out and they do it quarterly and they send it out to all of their clients. And the clients then, like Ben's saying, they then watch it later. And it and it and it's able allows you to manage the the conversation to how you're thinking from a what's going on in the world so that your clients are seeing that on a consistent basis. And so just because they don't show up doesn't mean they watch it and the value of it just for the quarter just to create calm and it lessens the inbound emails of reactive worried people. I mean, you're saving that off and you're saving time. You're creating time easily on that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Let's talk about Mark. What do you go ahead? Go ahead. Talk, talk a little okay. bit about maybe like the, so you talked about the rave reviews from clients um, with some of the, you know, virtual programming you were doing the virtual wine tasting, but talk about uh, the team. I mean, how, how do people feel, do people feel more productive and effective because they now have these tools and they've become kind of a habit. I mean, do people just, I mean, you talked about the morning huddle and being able to kind of connect with colleagues no matter where you are. What are what are some of the reactions of people in terms of like how they're enjoying their work and how engaged they are in their work? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think it's important that we all um, remember that this is still an interaction. So if it's, a, if it's an interaction with your team, a meeting, if you're having a big meeting, you're going to do something fun. You might have some music going or you have a raffle or, you know, whatever it is. So you need to, we, I think you need to take that still into the, in the virtual format also into Zoom um, and then not just have it be, you know, something that is, that is blase. You have to put the same attention to it as if they were all coming into your office and looking at you. Um, and that's what we've been able to do. And that's, that's what I think has kept it both interesting and in, in keeping um, the team and, and, the, and the associates and the staff engaged is not just having it be, um, you know, we're all on the screen and, and going through the motions. You know, it's, we, we treat it like, a, um, like we're actually in person and, you know, say hello to each other and that kind of thing and, and look at each other. Uh, that's, that's what I think has kept it fresh for us instead of having it be stale. Uh, you know, outside of the office, we've probably all run into the the Zoom fatigue, and we don't want to do another virtual, you know, whatever or whatever. Um, and I think clients are the same, associates are the same, team members are the same. Uh, so we need to, I think, keep it as fresh as possible. Um, it, you know, it, we, we've even done it on a quarterly basis. We do a, a kind of a team outing, whether it's a bowling night or something like that. So during the, the pandemic, we did a similar thing where Zoom, we, we kept it going quarterly, Zoom happy hours or whatever, and, and, and kept people engaged like that. And I agree with Ben says, a lot of people don't wanna see long um, Zooms, whether it's a meeting or a, a seminar. We, you know, we, do, we, we manage some 401ks across the country. So if we're talking to um, you know, a company that has 100 plus um, um, employees, um, when we're doing a Zoom, we keep it very short. We'll do a raffle, do some questions, uh, you, you know, I think you need to keep people engaged and, and not take for granted that they're on the screen and, and uh, you need to keep them engaged and keep them interested. Fantastic. Yeah, and and talk, talk questions, wine, wine tastings, like those activities that keep them engaged are, are huge, huge. Yeah, I mean, the, the wine tasting, even the wine tasting, if, if you just sat there and had a sommelier that's really smart, 
just talk about the wine, you know, while, while, while everybody's going to, you know, fall asleep and, and pay attention. So we, we had questions going in and did kind of fun things. And, uh, and you know, we got more interaction on, on Zoom than we ever did in person. <laughs> Fantastic. So, I mean, talk a little bit about like, um, so, so Mark, maybe get, take out your crystal ball a little bit. I mean, say, so I think there's huge pent up demand for some of the things that we've traditionally done. And so as the pandemic is easing, so I'm kind of curious, like, where do you sense there's, sense there's a lot of pent up demand for kind of the more traditional client engagement formats? And then what's not going to change? I mean, what's going to be the new normal, if you will? I mean, what are some of the habits and tricks you guys have picked up that you see like, hey, we're going to do this forever? Because pandemic or not, this is the right way to, you know, kind of scale the operation or engage with people using technology. Yeah, well, I think personal interaction is is important. I mean, I'm getting, I'm already getting calls from, you know, clients that are around the country say, you know, when are you coming out? You know, Fourth of July in Colorado, or you know, come the East Coast. So I'm definitely starting to see that more and more, and I think that's going to be pervasive um, across this industry and beyond. That people are going to want to see people that, that they haven't seen in a while. Um, but but going forward again, I think we we also look at where it, it's it's actually been more effective to have this kind of technology. So the 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 video uh, client strategy review meetings I think are going to be with us to stay. I mean it's it's phenomenal that we can you know be talking to someone no matter where they are, play with their financial plan, show them different strategies, and then get to a place in a few minutes uh, rather than you know going out to them, coming back, and then going back to them. It, it's it, you know it's much more impactful and 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 quick. Um, uh, for clients. Um, and then I also think the communication that we're talking about in terms of getting information out to clients, not uh, just focus on local events at, at hotels and restaurants, um, but, you know, if there's a if there's a topic that is, is timely, I mean, we, we were able to do a, a, a video Zoom event with one of the top political strategists in Washington, D.C., uh, two days after the, the election. Um, and, you know, that was one of our more widely uh, attended events. I mean, just this, the the things that you can do um, so quickly that you know there's no way we're, we were to fly that person from DC to uh, LA two days after the election when that, that's so important to their world. Um, so I think those kind of things are, are going to be with us to stay, and 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 those are going to lead to great client outcomes and, and and be great for business. Fantastic. So great comments, Mark, about what's going to you know what the pandemic has changed, what's not going to change, and there's some mega trends certainly there. So let's let's change gears and Ben, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that you guys um, exploited during the, the pandemic and, and changed and talk a little bit about the, the digital client journey and some of your marketing activities. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing, especially, and we kind of touched on this already with, with Mark and, 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 Matt, and with Mark and Matt was, you know, how do, how do we, how do we adopt when everyone was working from home, right? And, 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 and early last year and, you know, and, and what we found was that a lot of our onboarding process and a lot of our operational process was pretty scattered around, right? We, we custody a lot of our assets to Charles Schwab, and they have their own set of forms and documents. Other custodians have their own set of forms. But then how do we get those to clients in, in a seamless way? Um, I don't, who, has, who has a simple, like, IRA distribution form, right? Who has a fax anymore, right? No, no, no one in the right mind has a fax in, in, their, in their house anymore, <laughs> you know? And so getting how they get those forms and, and, and let alone – investment policy statements and, and onboarding statements. So we have, I mean, one of the big things is, is to make it easier. We adopted the same digital digital account opening process across all of our clients uh, from start to nuts, start to finish, right? Whether it's our forms, our Afrin forms, or Schwab forms, we've really started that process to make it one seamless event for the client, right? And I would say a year and a half ago, or 18 months ago, I would joke in the office that it was easier for us to, to it was easier for a client to start a mortgage, they'd be client, become a client of Aprium, right? We had so many different forms, whether it's our wealth management agreement, our investment policy statement, our privacy policy, our ADV, right? Our Gibbs brochure. And it was all these things are stuck in documents. And so we making that all digital and make it in a nice digital format with one email summarizing it and, and, and not legalese, in plain English of what, what, what you're getting. I think that's one, one of the huge things that we've been doing to make it easier for clients to become a client of Aprium. And so really that's what our focus is, is just to make things easier. We you know single single signatures, not sign a hundred times, right? I, I you know, I just refinanced a couple months ago. I was, just, I was there with the noting for half an hour, you know, <laughs> signing different things and trying to become a, make, make it easier for our clients and for our advisors to uh, make it smooth, right? And so right now what we do is we use um, right signature. 
uh, we'd adopted a share file, which is, uh, you know, like a Dropbox kind of situation that was vetted for our, from our compliance team. And they have everything called write signature. And it's cool because it just it, the, this you know just this this document just bounces back between the advisor and the prospect or soon to be client, and then and then it goes to me for approval, and it's all digital, and it just makes it, it makes it so much easier to to keep to monitor everything, and so um, it's been it's and been how, a fun. How, how, how have clients reacted? I mean, what kind of a, I mean, have you gotten any you know tangible positive feedback on, or are uh, you just seeing like greater efficiency and productivity and what kind of business oh. outcomes are you seeing or kind of feedback are you getting from clients for this new experience? Well, for a couple of things, right? With the onboarding process, it's, it's still taking time. It's being, it's more efficient. And most of our clients do like it. And, and we're getting paperwork. The turnaround time from for our admin team is, is probably a lot lower now than it was a few months ago or six months ago. So turnaround time, lost paperwork is, is has improved dramatically for from, from this aspect, Ted. From an aspect of, of kind of like what you're talking about with, um, when Mark was mentioning with client meetings, right? Um, I felt like we had to meet clients where they wanted to meet. And initially, we would try different uh, different uh, uh, virtual providers, WebEx, you know, all these different companies out there. I don't know, go to meeting, and we're finding that was tough because we're telling clients to go to what our platform, what our preferred platform is. Well, why would you want to do that? We're finding basically what the clientele that that was skew is a little bit older. Um, we had to meet them where they were, and they all had Zoom. Okay, they were all were already talking to to, to 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 their grandkids on Zoom. So let's meet them where that to make it easier for for the for us to talk to them. We do use Teams internally, but we use Zoom for external meetings, and 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 that was a tough decision, right? We had to convert and, and make all these changes, but um, I think it was it was a really good where we try to try to make it easier for the client to do business with us. But that also poses another problem, right? Now I got in in the past. I'm listening to you guys and talking right on all these things. I think I probably added more technology vendors in the past year than I have in the last five years. Okay, <laughs> and so now I got a technology stack that's that that's that's taller than me, and how do I manage it? And so it, it yeah, it does it does raise some new challenges. Tough, right? so. Make sure they're all compliant and and and, and make sure they're all good with the SEC and doing all this due diligence process for a small firm like us is is is, is quite tough too. And so, and where's the friction? I mean, is it losing sleep about cybersecurity issues or just dealing with the complexity with the staff and training and onboarding new employees with this monstrous uh, software stack? I mean, where, where does the friction point pop up? Uh, the friction point for me is, is number one, obviously compliance and making sure we don't have any breaks, right? Because there the could be, the more, the bigger the stack, the, the, more, the more potential holes there are. But that's just me. I, I think the bigger issue, I think, is also making sure that, and, and Michael and Matt already talked about this, is making sure that the, the vendors that we do use we're, are being used. We just don't roll out a cool, shiny new shiny new new toy if it's not being used and adopted by, by the staff and, and employees. And finding a champion for that is, is really key, something that can really handle it. And then, and then making sure that the, the employee, employees know. Um, luckily, you know, the, on the compliance side, that's really my end. You know, that, that's really my, my, my role at, at the firm is, is really making sure that these clients, or these vendors that we have, do have a privacy policy they're insured they, they're you know all, all, all those good stuff but real leveraging a technology partner helps us helps helps us with that too i, I just well, i just want to jump in real quick ted and, and just I, I don't something that ben just said i don't think can be emphasized enough and that is utilizing the technology that you have purchased i, I cannot tell you how many organizations we engage with where, where we come in and, and we look at their technology stack and we find that they're using 10 15 20 percent of the functionality that's that's available to them and and you know so often people think bringing in a company like us you know a cybersecurity expert whatever is going to be expensive and we're going to have to spend lots of money and whatever else but you know so often it's just about hey let's just flip the switches that are already in place let's just turn things on and start using things that we're already paying for and they're already there and they're already available and, and it's literally just a matter of educating people that this is here and, and how to use it and and i mean i think there's tremendous opportunity there to just start using what you've already got you know, what would be some of the glaring examples of where you see people have made investments and they're just not leveraging them enough? So, I mean, I, I tend to look at the world through a, a cybersecurity lens, right? Like I spend most of my day fighting bad guys. But like one, one of the, the, the biggest examples I have from a cybersecurity standpoint is, is the multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, when you're when you're implementing all of these new technologies and you're you're plugging things together and whatever else, you, you got to make sure that they're secure. You, you got to make sure that the bad guys aren't going to get in. 
And the overwhelming majority of all of these vendors across all the platforms offer the multi-factor authentication for free. And it's just a matter of turning it on and, and educating people on how to use it. And, and what that does for you from a cybersecurity standpoint in terms of upping your game and making it you know, exponentially more difficult for the bad guys if you have that stuff enabled and it, it costs nothing to implement. And, and but why, you know, so multi-factor authentication, it seems like a no-brainer, but why are there, why are there hurdles? I mean, why do you step into an account and discover, well, you've got MFA on all these different apps and they're not enabled. So what, what's, what's holding folks back? I, th I think it goes back to what Ben said, and, and you know, there was a key point in, in what Ben said, which is, you know, when you select a new product, there's got to be a champion for that product. And, and that champion really has to make themselves an expert in whatever that product is. And it, it doesn't have to be the same person in your organization that's a champion for every single product you have. You could have, you know, Ben is a champion for this stuff, and Matt's a champion for that stuff, and Mark's a champion for this stuff. Like people can have different, you know, you can have different advocates for the products, but that advocate needs to dive in. They they need to go to the user conferences, they need to read the documentation, they need to participate in the discussion groups, all these things that are available to find out what these tools are capable of and, and make sure that you're turning these switches on and you're really fully leveraging the investment you're making in all these tools. And that's a that's a great point to, for like your high potentials, right? Some of your high potential younger employees that you're trying to give them something more to do, they would love this. They get a sense of ownership. They get to, and if you are if you want to develop this culture of learning, of innovation, of getting best use out of your technology, give them the ability to run with it and and support them in that. And uh, and they will go and and find new aspects. I mean, Ben was talking about it with Canva and marketing and cutting up all the videos. Let them run with it, and uh, and you'll be surprised what you can find, and you'll start getting more value out of all the technologies. And then they'll come together, and they'll start talking to each other about, well, you're using this one. How can I better use it? And now you have experts in making the whole firm better, and it's a great way of engaging and providing the sense of ownership to your high, high potentials. Yeah, truth be told, I have no idea what Canva is. This is just what my millennials told me to say. <laughs> They're the ones that are the champions of oh, Canva. I heard it's really cool, though, but I've never used it. <laughs> it's very cool. <laughs> I think on the, on the on the notion of cyber security and and, and security um, broadly, well, I mentioned earlier, I think that's a table stake. I mean, clients expect that, and they don't expect it to be anything else but phenomenal. Um, and it's also, um, I think, part of the reason why they expect it. It's also one of the the things that's on the minds of clients around the country when it comes to their money. They're they're thinking about security and cybersecurity from all different angles and all different um, perspectives. That's become almost a regular annual event for us, where we bring in a cybersecurity expert. Um, it could be someone from the, you know VC or, or people that have headed up um, cybersecurity for for large institutions, uh, and those are some of the most well attended you know client events. It's on the minds of clients um, and. And it's all of our responsibilities to think of it as table stakes and to make sure that we have, you know, the, the best, safest environment for, for the clients and their data. And, and it's so, not just that we have, to have, we have to have good, good, you know, make sure it's good, but we have to show that it's good too, right? It's like the, always the analogy of who wants to eat in a dirty kitchen, right? You never want to eat in a dirty kitchen. And I think you, you do have to show clients that although our back office is good, digital is good, you have to show them that it's good. It has to look nice. You know, they have to be confident in, in that, that we have done things like cybersecurity checkups. We are, we have backups. We are on the cloud. We've done penetration and phishing tests, you know, to, to make sure that their, 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 their data is secure. We have a lot of client data, you know, so right. clients are starting to ask right. those questions. So it's okay, a, right. it's a table stake for clients, but it's also a table stake for regulators. And, and, and Michael, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, what are those stakes uh, in the game in terms of what the SEC is looking for and and how do you advise your clients in that area? Yeah, yeah I, I mentioned earlier, I, I, I live in the in the cybersecurity world. I look at things through that lens. And, and so I spend a good part of every day kind of fighting bad guys and, and monitoring what they're doing and that type of thing. And, and the analogy that I, I like to use is, um, you know, if you think about what you do to protect your house. So if I'm a robber and, and I decide today I'm going to go rob a house and I'm walking down your street and your house has, you know, a sign in front showing that you've got an alarm company that's monitoring it. And, you know, there's a, a big burly dog that's barking at me when I walk up to the front door and, you know, there's the, the door is locked and the garage door is shut and, and all that sort of thing. 
versus when I keep walking down the street and, and I go to the house next door and there's a stack of papers in the driveway and there's no alarm sign and you know it looks like nobody's been home in a while, all the lights are out, that type of thing. Obviously, that's the house that I'm that I'm going to rob. And so, from from my standpoint, really, what what we're trying to do, like, you know, at the end of the day, and we've seen it repeatedly with with uh, a lot of the stuff that's happened with, um, you know, some of the cyber attacks against the U.S. government recently. If 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 you have an adversary that's well funded enough and is sophisticated enough, they're going to get you. And so, there's nothing you can do to completely eliminate the risk. But what you want to do is you want to be that house with the alarm and the guard dog and and the outdoor lighting and and all that sort of thing. And so. What we find when we go into customers is that there are some very simple things that you can do analogous to what I just described with the dog and all those other types of things in your technology environment that really make you a very undesirable target from a cybersecurity standpoint. And, and so, you know, it's going to cause the bad guys to just kind of go to the next house and, and see what else is available to them because they're looking for low hanging fruit. They're looking to make a quick buck. Um, and so if you can put some of these simple protections in place and so the, the way that we accomplish this is is through this rapid security assessment where we're going to come in and again we're not going to eliminate risk because that's not possible but what we're going to do is we're going to look for a lot of the low hanging fruit so even before you take a step uh, like what Ben talked about the you know going out and getting a penetration test or whatever else let's eliminate the low hanging fruit because if I'm going to pay a professional to do a penetra uh, penetration test I don't want him finding the easy stuff. Um, you know, that that's that, you know, could have been eliminated beforehand. So let's do this rapid security assessment. Let's do it quickly. Let's let's, you know, do something within a period of a week and, and let's get a to do list for us. of What can we take care of very quickly um, that will dramatically, you know, dramatic return on investment in terms of the increased cybersecurity we have with with minimal effort. And so that's really what this rapid security assessment is is designed to do is to come in and examine quickly, deliver a report and then help to create a plan for Hey, let's get rid of all this low-hanging stuff, and then we can circle back after that and have you know additional discussion about okay, what what do we do next? Michael, so how does this change? Because using your analogy, you know, a, a year or two years ago, I had I had one house to guard right here. Now I got fifteen houses to guard because right? I got 15, 15 people working from home. <laughs> um, yeah. How, how does that change in, in terms of like what we what we should think about in terms of security and, and managing all these all these what I call open doors? Yeah, for sure. And and that's something that, you know, we we really have to look at as as part of not only the rapid security assessment but the the cybersecurity strategy overall is is, you know, the the term that we use to refer to it as attack surface. So w what are the potential ways in? Where where are the holes in the system? And to your point, you know, whereas 2 years ago I may have just had kind of one central location that I that I have to, you know, kind of provide protection against. Yeah, now I've you know, the, everybody from that one central location has now been distributed out, you know, across the city, across the county, whatever else. Um, and so I've got to I've got to provide protection for all these things. The other thing to think about as well is a lot of this happened very rapidly. So like you mentioned, hey, I've added more technology vendors in the past year than, you know, I've added for the previous whatever period. And so, you know, I think now that, you know, the environment's starting to change, like Mark talked about, hey, I've got customers that are starting to ask me about coming out to visit again. So we're starting to see this shift back. Well, now's a great opportunity to kind of step back and say, hey, let, let's let's take a deeper look at all these vendors that we've added in the past year. And, and let's make sure that, you know, we've got uh, our compliance documentation is up to date, that we've thoroughly assessed these vendors and, and you know, made sure that they're checking all the boxes, that we've turned on all of the features that are available to us from a cybersecurity standpoint. So I, I think now is the perfect time to kind of say, okay, let's take a breath and, and let's really reassess where we are and, and establish a new baseline for going forward. And and how do how if if anyone's interested in doing the rapid security assessment, what would the experience be like? How easy is it to get started? Uh, who is it? Who is who's the an, an offer like this designed for? Yeah, so really this is designed for uh, registered investment advisors. Um, you know, obviously SEC regulated. Uh, it, it it's a very quick engagement. So normally, you know, we do a lot of our scanning. Over a day or two, uh, it takes us a few days to do the analysis. So this is normally something that can be completed within a week or two weeks. And then we have this follow-up meeting where we kind of discuss everything that we found and you know what's actionable. As as we've talked about throughout, a lot of it doesn't involve any cost whatsoever. It's just flipping switches, turning things on, enabling features. Um, and and so normally this is something that we charge twenty four ninety five for. But for the people that are on the webinar today who or mention this webinar when they call us. 
uh, we're doing it for 7.95 just because we want to get this out there very quickly because we see this as a great first step in a journey to to kind of getting a hold of the technology after all the changes that we've talked about have occurred over the past year. And what are what are some of the like low hanging fruit items or big wins that you can accomplish that a client can expect to get out of this process? I mean, I got to tell you, we, we've done a ton of these rapid security assessments. And, and I mean, I can almost tell you before I walk in the door some of the things that we're going to find. So so we've already talked about the multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, getting that turned on. Um, we almost always are going to find accounts that are still active from people who are no longer with the organization or people who haven't logged on in, you know, months or, or even years in many cases. Um, passwords that haven't been changed. I mean, we, we did a password scan at a customer recently and found a password that someone hadn't changed for 12 years. Um, you know, so so just things like, you know, uh, people who have administrative accounts. Uh, you know, one of the things that Matt talked about was the integration between all these different software packages. Well, that's great. But a lot of times when when you have two companies trying to integrate with each other, they start out with, well, let's just give each other full rights to our entire application just so we can get it working. And then the problem is there's never a follow-on conversation to say, okay, this is working now. Now let's scale back what you have access to and only give you access to the minimum set of data that you need in order to accomplish whatever it is we want this integration to accomplish. And so, you know, that's another one where we find just stuff is just kind of wide open to the world and nobody ever had that follow-up discussion to say, okay, let's, let's notch this back. We want it to keep working, but, you know, we want you to have the minimum that you need to have in order for that to work. Okay, and just um, if you are interested uh, in the rapid security assessment, please just reach out to Michael uh, directly. You've got his email address right there, the IT Synergy website. Um, we welcome uh, any any financial advisors and RIA organizations that are interested in exploring the cybersecurity capabilities from IT Synergy to please reach out and engage. Um, at this point, we're, we're pretty much out of time. This was a fantastic discussion. Um, we covered a lot of ground, everything from the early days of the pandemic and, and the, the, the stress and worry and uncertainty that everybody felt in that uh, part of this journey and, and all the amazing changes that have happened in the, the business of being a, a wealth manager or financial advisor in the past uh, 12 to 14 months or so. So uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for a fantastic discussion. Matt Reiner, Mark Ackerman, Benjamin Lau, uh, and our sponsor and host, Michael Kokenauer. Uh, thank you guys jo for joining us for this virtual Lunch and Learn. Thank you to all our guests. Please uh, reach out to the IT Synergy team if you have some follow-on questions. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.